Welcome to the Not Quite Daily Show, Spring 2018, Episode 12. We're discussing the self-titled 23rd installment of Darling in the Franks, which is our second to last episode. So, giant robot girl, right? Not so much 02 as the 02000. I feel like there was probably much scratching of heads during that moment in the greater anime community. Not you guys though, right? I mean, we've been talking about the importance of transformation as a theme lately, um, especially the emphasis in the past few episodes. We even speculated already that knowing the past Klaxosapien fate of the girls bonding to the body and the guys bonding to the cockpit suggested that our main couple might eventually go that route. Then there was the picture book parallels, as the thing the Beast Princess changes into is not just non-human, but also completely unlike the type of beast she was before. It was just this that prompted me to speculate she might be Strelesia in truth when episode 21 suggested that she might have died. Finally, we also talked about the Grand Cradle inside Star Entity as being both womb-like and pistol-like, and along with its name of Cradle, it strongly suggested that something new would be born of the encounter. This episode was probably the final disappointment for people who believed the show was about robots fighting monsters, and then apparently also aliens. Um, that has always just been the background. Even in this episode, with a massive spaceship and robot shootout, the actual battles of consequence are between our two sets of couples, as they attempt to exercise their right to self-determination. This is a showdown of our fate versus desire theme, showcasing the differences between a fate one is subject to and a fate chosen for oneself, and even when one gets a rare chance to reconsider that fate. I do think this episode suffers by comparison with the excellence of episode 22, and introducing so many new elements this late in a series is often disorienting for an audience. Um, in this respect, there is also some wisdom to putting the most surprising element into this episode rather than the next one. With a week to adjust to the idea of the Zero 2000, the finale will not be derailed by the audience being caught off guard. Now, her changed form is surprising. It's not exactly what I would have guessed, um, but I had guessed that it would be something. And a lot about the choice is consistent with our existing patterns and world building uh, and Zero Two's own characterization. How she chooses to be represented is the culmination of her long internal battle, a struggle between how she sees herself as opposed to the image that she wants to present. She has resisted accepting that she is actually Klaxo Sapien, that she is not human and never will be. With this episode, the audience might find themselves in the same position, hesitant to accept that the form of her that we've grown attached to was never true, that it was always a mask. Perhaps then the audience can now empathize with Zero Two's long reluctance to abandon this dream of humanity. Reconciling these ideas is a triumph for her, and comes at the moment that she completes her character arc. That completion also results in her greatest act of love toward Hero in the series, an act that was foreshadowed several times in the second half of the show. Let us then explore exactly how we get to that moment. So, as we first assumed, Kokoro and Mitsuru's story is going to play out in tandem to the giant battle in space, and Kokoro takes over narrating duties to reflect this. Everyone else is focused on what will surely be their last battle, yet she is preoccupied by her situation and Mitsuru's decision to stay. We get to see the part they skipped on us, with Mitsuru informing Hiro he was going to stay behind. Like we talked about last time, the importance of having and making your own choice was a prominent theme throughout last episode. Hiro calls it correctly, rhetorically asking Mitsuru if he has chosen this battlefield. In the present, though, Kokoro doesn't understand. She is troubled that Mitsuru has stayed, and tells him he could have found another partner. Mitsuru indicates that he wanted to stay, that it is his responsibility to see this through. Now, this isn't true. He wants to stay for her, to be with her, to get to know more about her. But at this point in their battle, it's not something that he can cop to. So he uses the excuse of responsibility, and that is exactly what she focuses on. She questions whether it is his responsibility when he doesn't remember anything. Uh, she rejects this excuse of his, basically, telling him that he has no responsibility, that she has no expectations from him. 
If Mitsuru wants to close the distance between them, making it something impersonal like responsibility is not going to do the trick. As I mentioned, fate versus desire is all over this episode, and this is the first instance. Staying with Kokoro because he's the father of her child is a type of fate, a predetermined course for his actions that, at this point, is beyond his control. Yet, she rejects this for him. She doesn't want an attachment from a place of fate or responsibility. Their battle for this episode will be getting to a place where it is clearly desire that rules their choice. Her side of the coin is that she still feels bereft of purpose. Her fate to be a parasite has been ripped away from her. She will now struggle for a new purpose. But will it be a purpose that she is fated for, or one she chooses from her own place of desire? Finally, we see that Zero Two's body has indeed remained here on Earth. They never explain this, though since Kokoro appears to be the caretaker for her and her injuries, our guess about it being unsafe to take her might be close enough. Considering the eventual situation in space, it seems the prudent choice. After the credits, we join our fleet in space as the squad tries out their new fittings that will allow them to fight in three dimensions. I will say here at the outset that though the battle takes a fair amount of screen space this episode, we are going to deal with them in broad strokes only. Um, as I said in the intro, this has never been what the show is about, something that makes it a lot different from the many shows people have tried to compare it against. Um, and I'll talk more about that later on. We're just going to collect relevant or interesting details as we go along. First, there is simply the fact of the squad having fittings allowing them to fight in space at all. Uh, let's just note that the blasts of their propulsion are that red and blue together but unmixed, reinforcing that idea that we talked about last time. Then we see that Nana and Hachi are in fact going with them on this mission, staying aboard the mothership. They comment on the fittings for the Franks and the provisions on the ship, and the idea that the Klaxosaurus really might have left all this for them. With the information we have at this point, this all seems pretty convenient, right? Like, that mothership would have had to have been waiting 60 million years, even if the provisions or whatever were added recently. And creating fittings for the humans' franks seems like the kind of thing they would not do. However, later on we will learn the real purpose of this mothership and the gate that waits above Mars. Combined with the number of Klaxosaurs that take the form of starships, we can assume that Klaxosociety planned all along not just to defend themselves from Verm, but to strike back. They never really brought their full force to bear against humanity for a very good reason. Humans aren't their real enemies. Thus, Hachi's statement here as they ponder the situation. That would mean humanity has been allowed to join the fight to defend Earth. Nana's questioning about whether they have the right echoes Fatoshi's sentiments from last episode about using magma energy. Now that they know the real score between them and Klaxosaurs, those left realize that they were the pawns of aggressors, not a people defending themselves. Imagine finding out that you were almost complicit in genocide. I imagine some very confusing emotions would accompany that, yeah? Um, unfortunately, we can't slow down the narrative at this stage to show our group spend a little more time wrestling with this idea, but we do at least have these moments to remind us that the remaining humans are in kind of a weird place. Lastly, we see that Hero and Nine Alpha are piloting together. As we suggested last time, the Nines and Zero Two being able to pilot is not about them being fertile and is instead about them being genetically Klaxosapiens already. Thus, they can be Pistol or Stamen, Thus, Hero can pilot with one of them, just as he does with Zero Two. After all his dismissiveness towards humans, Nine Alpha himself is amused at the irony of his final partner being a human. His choice of final there echoes their sentiment from last time, that they expect to spend themselves in this battle. Anyway, all the world-building elements necessary for this space battle to make sense are set up now. Time to load up and actually get to the front lines. We have a brief interlude to show us that Kokoro is attending to Zero Two's constant injuries. She has not fared well working in the fields, and as she says here, she is not a parasite anymore. Purpose still eludes her, thus the tiny responsibility of looking after Zero Two gets all of her attention this episode. It's small, but it's something. Returning to Nana and Hachi on the bridge, they talk about how well they understand the control scheme of the Klaxosaur ship, leading Hachi to suppose that Homo sapiens and Klaxosapiens were not so different from one another. I want to point out that we still don't have any information about the rise of humanity, about whether it differed from the natural history we assume, or if something involving Klaxosapiens influenced it. We might not get any answer on this, 
Um, in fact, this may just be another way of demonstrating that human society and Klaxo society have a lot of aspects in common, inviting us to draw a parallel between their two fates. If it ends up being more, though, this will be another instance of foreshadowing that reveal. The other part of this conversation is Nana realizing that she feels empathy with the children, though without actually understanding that this is what she's experiencing. She doesn't want to see them hurt anymore, but is confused as to why. After all, she watched over them as tools of warfare for so long without feeling this way. Hachi, though, basically questions what is wrong with this idea. If their fighting days are about to be over, and her purpose is to look after them, then won't they need someone just like her in the days to come? Someone who doesn't want to see them hurt any longer? Nana has always seemed the more emotionally present between these two, as Hachi's stoicism seemed just the thing that Ape wanted from humanity. But ever since the crashing of the wedding, I think it's really rather that Hachi has been the one to develop empathy faster than Nana has. Though he's self-aware enough to realize that a concerned Nana is a better caretaker than he is, I think he actually became invested in the children as people first. I don't know exactly when it started, um, but his loyalty to Dr. Franks rather than Ape extends at least back to the Grand Crevasse battle, uh, if not longer. His insistence on carrying out Dr. Franks' last wishes and compelling Nana to return to her role as caretaker might end up being rather vital choices in the long run. At the very least, Nana's developing empathy and embracing of her new role will only gain encouragement from Hachi. A last bit of business before battle. Hiro has some paper in his hand that we don't get to see, though we will later learn that it is the photo they took before the wedding. That was the last day that their squad was fully whole, thanks to the memory wipe. Looking over it like this may foreshadow that he knows there might be no returning to the state, that this was the last time they would ever all be together. Ichigo and Goto join him, reminding us how long the three of them have been together. They make things right between them, in what is potentially the last time these three ever stand together. Nine Alpha overhears just a bit of this exchange, and then it is time for battle. Again, we're not going to worry too much about the details of the battle. The way the mothership plows through towards Apus tells us that bringing them together is the real goal here, rather than the destruction of the Verm fleet. The intensity of the fire leaves our Frank squad at a loss as to what to do, until Strelesia comes into view. Unsurprisingly, that is all it takes for Hero to charge recklessly into the fray, at which point the squad pretty much has to join in. Strelesia appears to be completely passive, just floating in space, arms folded in front of her. They theorize that she can't fire the huge laser because she's not truly operational without a stamen. All pull off and attempts to block their progress, it seems that they believe the same thing, so preventing Hero from reaching her becomes their priority. The squad pushes themselves to make this a reality nonetheless, resulting in Hero and Nine Alpha being cut off from the rest. Some final boss, Vermasaur, stands between them and their goal, and they quickly realize they won't be defeating it, especially by themselves. Nine Alpha opts to ensure that Hero get inside anyway, before preparing to suicide himself to stop this new threat. As he says, his home is the battlefield and nowhere else. Even in the absence of Papa, the Nine still cling to their purpose of being a tool of warfare. Nine Alpha suggests that his brief time with Squad 13 at least taught him a little bit about being human. It may be that with more time to have interacted, the Nines might have found another purpose after all. Um, I don't think there's enough characterization here to really think of this as some kind of redemption arc for them. Uh, really, their story is just kind of sad. Um, they might be an echo of what Zero Two would have been if not for meeting Hero in her youth. Once Hero is actually inside, the real battle can begin. Hero thinks the things he wants to ask her. Why did she run off alone? Didn't they promise to always be together? He wants an answer to the same question I posed in speculation last time. Knowing that this leaving was foreshadowed by the picture book, why did she choose to flee anyway? As we've said for some time, it can't be because she's afraid of what Hero would think of her. Last time we suggested that it may have been to spare the prince's life, as that was the other part of the picture book story. That turns out to be not too far off the mark. Hero settles in behind what looks like an elaborate dummy pistol, complete with handles and the display hood that is not actually connected to a person. As Hero attempts to connect, the Zero Two back on Earth begins walking toward the place in the sky where the battle rages. Her body seems to fall apart as Kokoro looks on in bewilderment and horror. We'll talk more about this later. 
She looks up in the sky, and the mind-meld rushing star field begins, signaling the beginning of a connection. It's not enough to actually connect, though, and the compartment containing the dummy hood pops open, revealing an array of invasive-looking tubes that rive the sentience. It appears that just as Zero Two's mind is more fully meshed with Strelizia than any normal piloting, Hero himself will need to be more fully meshed in order to communicate with her. He has no hesitation on the matter, which, again, shouldn't surprise us at all. Connecting to Zero Two's mind this time puts them each into the world of the picture book. Inside this world, Zero Two does not appear as the Beast Princess before or after turning into a human, nor does she appear as her mostly human form that is still on Earth, and nor does she appear as Strelizia. No, she appears as the little girl in the cloak, just as she did when Hero connected to her in episodes 12 and 15. Despite everything, this is still how she sees herself in her mind. She still thinks of herself as a monster in disguise. And so she warns Hero off. We should note that she appears at first in the place where the Beast Princess is introduced to the story, but afterwards she appears where the Prince is first introduced. I don't know if that is just stylistically to show us that they are moving through the stages of the story, or if she is intentionally taking on both roles so that Hero can't assume a role of his own in the story, um, or what there. Either way, when he questions her about why she would leave, she answers that she wanted him to remain human. This will get reiterated later when she says she was always a monster, but she wants him to live as a human. This is kind of an enormous moment for these characters, so we're going to revisit it in a few minutes when this scene continues. Outside, the battle rages on, with the mothership coming under heavy fire and the Frank squad scrambling to protect both it and Strelizia. As Nana and Hachi attempts to flee the embattled craft, an explosion injures Hachi. He knows he can't move on his own and urges Nana to leave him. Well, that ain't happening. She wanted him to leave her last episode, and he insisted on dragging her out and giving her new purpose. No way does he get to be the one to give up now. As she says, it's your duty to watch over their futures too. Hachi was suggesting that it was appropriate to feel the way Nana was feeling earlier about watching over the children, but it may be that he only saw her in that role of caretaker for their future. This is Nana insisting that he share that purpose as well. We haven't got a lot of chances to talk about Hachi's characterization, but I think we have had enough moments to suggest that he can be hesitant to act at times, as perhaps even a little insecure. Though he's quick to come to Nana's rescue in their youth, he stood by frozen as she was dragged away. He was unable to do anything at the broken up wedding, and later was full of self-doubt about what he was supposed to do for the parasites, about what he could do at all. Once he's back in the system, he resumes his stoic composure, and gaining Dr. Franks's orders keeps him focused uh, after his death, but he can be just as adrift as the rest at times. He's only too willing to give up at this point. Aiding him and forcing him onward here is effectively Nana paying it forward. And heck, she'll need the support too. They take what I guess is an escape pod from the mothership, and then can look back at the full scope of the thing, informing us that what sits amidship is an enormous bomb. No time to ponder the meaning of this though, as our former rulers of humanity have decided on this moment to... I'm not sure exactly try to convince the unthinking bioweapons and the second-class citizens of their former empire to play nice and assimilate? Whatever the reason, their profession of believing in equality for all, to the parasites and to the nines of all people, puts the lie to their whole ideology. They want to tear down distinctions, yet they themselves maintained such rigid distinctions in human society? They will attain an endless and peaceful slumber, yet also somehow endless and relentless evolution? Nana and Hachi weigh in on this, admitting that while the lives the adults had embraced might see that as utopia, the children would never belong. The flames of their lives will never burn as bright in perpetual tranquility. Okay, that's a little on the nose here, telling us that the two are ideologically opposed when it's something we already had enough information to figure out. That said, Hachi does at least add that it isn't a question of right or wrong, but rather one of choice. This is the choice that the children have made, and the remnants of humanity have made it with them. Anyway, there is zero risk that anyone will want to defect at this point, and Papa and his sidekick don't seem to show back up the rest of the episode. Perhaps this was just a last-ditch effort to stop them, now that Hero had made his way into Strelizia, where the true battle will turn. 
As our squad themselves note, there is another battle taking place on Earth, and so we cut to the remainder of Mitsuru and Kokoro's story. A storm rages here as one rages in space, but rather than seek shelter, Kokoro attempts to protect Zero Two from the rain and the wind. We've spoken before about Kokoro as a nurturer, that she has a sensitivity that both led her to wanting to manage the greenhouse and kept her hesitant about causing distress or disagreement with others. The greenhouse itself, we said, symbolizes Kokoro, as both are instruments for the bringing forth of new life. That instinct is what is driving her at this moment. The purpose of looking after Zero Two's body may be minor indeed, but as it's all she seems to believe in at the moment, it commands her full effort. Even at risk to herself, she begs that she can stay by her side. At this, Mitsuru decides he won't try to dissuade her. He won't ask her to turn from her path, but he will ask to join her. If there was any question that their story is meant to mirror Hero and Zero Two's, I think this episode should put that idea to rest. Now Kokoro resists him anyway, just as Zero Two currently resists Hero. She won't accept Mitsuru using some responsibility toward her as his own purpose. This time though, Mitsuru abandons this pretense. This isn't about responsibility. It's not a matter of fate or duty. He chooses this. He wants this. He doesn't understand love exactly, but he understands that somewhere in this is the purpose that he wants, his own reason to keep living. We said last time that he was likely gripping the wedding ring in his pocket and making his own choice in that moment. At this point of confessing the choice to Kokoro, he produces the ring. She is surprised he still has it. After all, didn't they agree that despite what the others said, they probably would never develop feelings for each other? Didn't they both take their rings off? And why did he keep saying her name even when it hurt him? Well, let me ask you, Kokoro. Why did you even notice he was doing that? Mitsuru says they don't need their memories. They can start over. Something we said before was that for their story to truly mirror Hero and Zero Twos, they would need to grow toward one another again even before regaining their memories, if that's something that can even happen. And it seems they have, as Kokoro produces her own wedding ring. She too was unwilling to throw it away. She won't accept Mitsuru as some partner who stays with her because he's supposed to. But if it's what he really wants, well, that's different. That's a choice. Their battle appears to be over. So that returns us to Hero and Zero Two. Zero Two retains her form as the downtrodden, cloned girl. Now even the fanciful background of the picture book has faded. She says she was always a monster, so whatever. But Hero? She wants him to live as a human, the thing she can't do. And the thing he can't do either if he's with her. This is what I meant when I said that Zero Two was making her biggest act of love. She has been trying to be human forever, wanted to become human so that she could meet her darling one day. In episode 16 though, she admits that she understood nothing about what being human really meant. She eventually realized it wasn't about appearances at all, but rather the way they cry and laugh, and get mad, and try to live together as a group. Being exposed to Squad 13's behavior with one another, once she decided to see them as having value at all, it helped answer her own question about what it means to be human. She says that she realized this was the kind of humanity she wanted all along. She will make a similar statement in the following episode, when they are discussing Kokoro's revelation about babies. She admits that she is envious. It's not something her body can do. And she says it's wonderful. You're all wonderful. You have the ability to decide your futures with your own hearts. These sentiments are echoed by the princess in the book, when she talks about how wonderful humans are in spite of all the things they don't have. They are such weak and frail creatures, but they are so, so warm. You understand? Zero Two came to understand humanity and love it utterly, and yet she knows that she can never be one. And loving it, and knowing she can't really be it, she can't ask Hero to abandon it. This is why she hesitates to agree when he professes happiness about growing his own horns, when he says, it's like I'm the same as you now. It's why she can't be honest with him about the dream she had of Star Entity reaching for her. And it's why she can't finish the picture book, or even really talk to him about it when they ride the elevator together. She has probably always known that she and Hero cannot be together, because she cannot really become a human. That was always a lie. They made a promise, sure, but a promise under false pretenses. Hero believed they could be the same kind of thing, and she couldn't figure out how to tell him it wasn't true. 
How could she hold him to a promise like that once it was too late to choose a different fate? So she flees to save the prince's life, or rather, she flees to save his humanity. This dichotomy between Zero Two's wish and reality has kept her frozen in a sense. This is why the image Zero Two has of herself in her mind is still that little girl in the brown cloak. Thus, as she is traveling around in the book, she doesn't take on the role of the princess she drew, but stays herself. Her physical self persists on Earth because it's what she wanted to become, but was always a mask that she put on. This is why we see her doing things like shaving her horns, and being appalled at him seeing her the way she was in episode 15. But I think it's also why, as soon as he connects to her, that body immediately takes damage, or seems to rapidly disintegrate. It's only an ideal of what she wants Hero to see. In her mind, she is still the monster. As she says in episode 14, she always knew that no matter how she disguised herself as a human, she could never be one of them. But if it meant being with her darling, she could keep pretending. Yet, this came to a head in episode 21, when she broke the headband and allowed her red skin and the antlers to come back. That was who she was under the mask of human appearance. There was no more room or time to pretend. But when it came down to keeping that mask in place, or saving Hero and everyone else, of course she chose the latter. And then, having saved the world for the moment, but abandoned her pretense of humanity, she leaves with Apis and the knowledge that she can never be human. And this completes her character arc, I think. If you remember back in episode 14, I talked about how the primary flaws of the three main characters caused all of the chaos that happened. For Hero, that flaw was his lack of confidence, something he slowly gained back after he and Zero Two reunited. For Zero Two, though, her flaw was a lack of empathy. But just as being with Zero Two helped Hero overcome his flaw, being with Hero has slowly turned Zero Two into someone capable of empathy. We saw this in her embracing of the squad. We saw it in her celebrating and then fighting on behalf of Mitsuru and Kokoro. We especially saw it when she forgave and thanked Dr. Franks for his role in her life. Now, despite how much being with her darling means to her, how much of her life has been driven by the solitary goal, she is able to turn aside. She won't trick him or coerce him or pretend that it's anything else. Because realizing how much humanity means to her, she cannot expect him to abandon it. She won't even ask. Her journey to empathy is complete. But just as Kokoro insisted Mitsuru leave her alone, yet still kept her ring, Zero Two secretly hopes that Hiro comes for her anyway, thus pausing there in space, thus leaving the picture book unfinished. And Hiro realizes this last part, calling her a liar when she says that she is fine by herself. Now, Zero Two appears in this mental world as the scared little girl, but Hiro, by contrast, appears as the version of the prince that he drew himself. We reiterated this last time as well, but way back when the picture book appeared, we suggested that the way to break the pattern of all these stories is for the princess to not be the only one undergoing transformation. If the prince sought out a deal of his own, tried to become the same thing as her, if he abandoned humanity to become a beast, then it might overturn their fate. It would rewrite the ending. So when he does choose this fate himself, without her asking, and even over her protest, and even understanding that he is surrendering his humanity, then she can accept. He changes from the prince of the story into himself, and she changes from the little girl into the self she wants to be. Then they are two human-like Klaxosapiens, naked and pure, no more masks between them, no more hiding. Hero takes her hand in a manner that recalls the wedding of the picture book, and gives her his vow to never let her go. The Jin bird, which, as we've discussed, was originally a symbol for marriage, then takes flight and moves through the picture book landscape. And doing this, accepting his vow like this, she gets to achieve something of a perfect form. Klaxo sapiens and truth joined to the body of Sterlesia Apis, and yet recalling the idealized version of her back on Earth. Thus able to reconcile these two halves of herself, she has no more need for the shell she left behind, which Kokoro and Mitsuru observe turning to stone or to ash or to otherwise being abandoned. Thus, it is no accident that she looks like a bride there at their joining. Abandoning the mask on Earth, she can relax into her true form. Inside the cockpit, Hero's horns are no longer subtle. His own transformation seems complete. 
This is basically their wedding, and when the warp gate opens between Mars's two moons, the path leading toward it strongly recalls the aisle that a bride walks down. The mothership bomb becomes her bouquet of flowers in this analogy, a symbol that we will dive into more fully in theme. Once these two are married, the battle is basically over, as our blue and red beam returns with some accompanying increased firepower. The fact of the bomb explains the mothership's existence as well. It wasn't placed there 60 million years ago to conveniently transport the not yet existing humans, nor were the space fittings meant for anything other than the many other types of Klaxosaurs that would normally have joined them in space. See, Klaxosapiens didn't just turn themselves into bioweapons. They turned their entire society into a single weapon. They pretended to hunker down for a siege for when Verm returned. In actuality, they were preparing an all-or-nothing counterstrike to wipe Verm out just as surely as they had tried to do to them. As Hiro explains, the size of the main Verm force means they need to take them by surprise. And so the Klaxosaurs don't use all of their weapons against humanity. They don't show Verm their hand. They create a warp gate far away from Earth, hiding its existence from Verm should they return. They are going to take them by surprise, all right. But it means that Hero and Zero Two have to leave everyone behind. They don't answer when Godot asks if they'll come back. Realizing this, the squad is distraught begging and demanding that they not go through with it. But when it's clear they cannot change this course, Ichigo demands that they come back, no matter how long it takes. She says they will build a home and wait for them. And Zero Two promises that she will come back, together with her darling. I think strongly implied here is that if they do come back, it will be quite some time from now. Now Kokoro resumes narration over our end moments, and we see she and Mitsuru have donned their rings again and hold hands. Now at the end of this episode, the two real battles are over. Both couples are walking into uncertainty, sure, but are willing to do so as long as they can walk together. Her ending narration is an endorsement of individualism and self-determination, and then concludes that all they can do is pray that what awaits Hero and Zero Two is a happy ending. Our final image is that picture of the squad that Hero was looking at earlier, set above the cockpit to remind him of the home they leave behind. Soon enough, we will see if they ever return. In Goals and Conflicts, we have a narrowing of the field down to just our remaining plot lines. Um, this is just what we should expect from the end of a series. In Goals, Hero's goal of getting to Zero Two is complete. Um, last time we observed that this goal takes precedence over everything else for Hero. We said that if his choices were between staying with her and going home to live out the new life they had won for themselves, he was going to choose staying with her. This went to the way we thought. Um, our Jen Bird and Picture Book are basically complete with the two transformations. Next episode will be all about the results of each of them achieving their goals concerning the other. For life beyond piloting, nothing else is in the way. With Verm chased from their solar system and Hero and Zero Two's fate beyond their ability to affect, the rest of Squad 13 is going to return and build a home for them all. Everything they choose from now on is a realization of this goal. Even if they fail utterly, it's still fulfilling this wish, chasing a purpose of their own choosing. Hero and Zero Two have made a similar choice. For the moment, it separates them, and perhaps it will always separate them. But it's exactly that bittersweet possibility that is contained in the freedom to choose and to choose differently. Lastly, a new goal for Hero and Zero Two, end the war. I will talk about this in speculation, but it's hard to guess what shape this end will take. Either way, it is the final mover of narrative. I don't doubt that it will be completed. Uh, the question is, what form will that completion take? So into conflicts then, uh, the APA situation is now true Strelesia. This has gone from conflict over the fate of Zero Two to the realization of Zero Two and Hero's long quest to be with one another forever. This one is resolved. The Verm invasion, uh, the script is flipped. This becomes now an end to the war, one way or the other. It's time for the invaders to become the invaded. As I said, Clack Society apparently forged their entire people into a weapon toward this end. It was not enough to defend themselves when Verm inevitably returned. No, they prepared to make Verm the ones at risk of annihilation, erasing them and their ideology from the universe. When, and all those concepts our squad values are safe, individuality, self-determination, social bonds, but lose, 
and it seems the only outcome is the eventual extinction of Earth and its inhabitants. So we're really only going to talk about two themes today, and the first one is kind of an amalgamation of themes. Uh, this is the theme of death and rebirth, together with fertility, but focusing on an aspect common to both, which is creation and destruction. To illustrate this, let's talk a bit about the amazing symbol of the mothership bomb as a bouquet of flowers, especially in the context of being held by a metaphorical bride. I've mentioned several times about flowers and weddings as fertility symbols, that it's the reason brides traditionally carry flowers at all. Weddings are a ritual centered around the idea of rebirth and fertility and continuance. The ceremony represents not just a public proclamation that two people have decided to be mates, but the establishment of a legal entity meant to establish a family as a unit. There's a lot of gravitas to a wedding, hence the fanfare and emphasis they garner. Yes, I know a wedding is not required for these things to happen, but it's what the wedding itself represents. Traditionally, weddings are the first step in the cycle of humans reproducing, much like flowers are that first step for plant life cycle. After all, flowers are the sex parts of plants. They are nature's fan service. Um, I mean, not really, since fan service implies gratuitous, and reproduction is certainly not gratuitous, but the colors and variety and ostentatiousness of flowers are perhaps not strictly necessary. I mean, humans can reproduce just fine without romance, or suggestive language or clothing, or dancing or dinners or flirting or anything of the sort, but hey, where's the fun in that? Combined in both of these examples, then, is the idea of the power of creation, of making something new. Flowers will lead to seeds and new plants, Weddings will lead to children and a new family, birth and rebirth. But then, the mothership is also an enormous bomb. In our post-nuclear age, it's hard to imagine a more powerful symbol of destruction than a bomb. One might think, perhaps, that creation and destruction shouldn't be combined like this, that they should be on opposite sides. The squad and their embracing of fertility puts them on the side of creation, right? Which should put Verm on the destruction side. Uh, and there are indeed stories where creation and destruction sit opposed to one another. But in our story, the two are actually together on the same side. Both creation and destruction are part of the natural cycle, that ever-present death and rebirth. We talked last time about how there is a unifying idea in this series of the forces of transformation against the forces of stasis, that most of our other themes can be contained within that tension. Transformation encompasses creation and destruction both. It's not creation versus destruction, like some of our other patterns, like nature versus artifice. No, it's creation and destruction, just like death and rebirth. Verm stopped reproduction and fertility in the adults, right? And that is stopping creation, right? But they also stopped death. They arrested the forces of change and sought to break free of the natural cycle. They are on the side of stasis, and that puts them against creation and destruction both. But that is not the way of nature, and so nature itself suffered and languished as a result. Thus, on Earth, the potential to sustain that creation, destruction, death, and rebirth cycle is almost completely spent. And so our squad's journey to their own humanity and identity and future then becomes a quest to overturn this unnatural idea of stasis. In this way, their various quests for love become not an incidental sideshow during a rebellion, but the actual main driving force that allows Verm's rule to be overturned. And yet, just like last episode, where the power to choose was not some automatic improvement with only good and easy results, the romantic subplots have not been portrayed as only a constructive, positive force. Our primary couples struggled through trials to be together and fighting off external and internal threats. Once each was successful, their stories became examples of creative power, literally in the sense of Mitsuru and Kokoro, and perhaps only figuratively in the as-yet-unknown outcome for Hero and Zero 2. But we have constant heartbreak in our squad as well, don't we? Goro, Ichigo, Ikuno, Futoshi, uh, there is a lot of destructive and disruptive outcomes to their freedom to love and pursue as they choose. We should understand that stasis is not being put up against the creative and positive aspects of love only, but also against its fallout, against its heartbreak and pain. 
the freedom to pursue love comes with consequence. Our series is not pretending that romance is purely a boon. All of the drama and love triangles and rejection in the show embody this idea of creation and destruction, of transformation, change. Thus, the amazing significance of a wedding bouquet that is also a bomb. Fertility, but also what it implies, creation and destruction together. And I love it. Calling the parasites pistols and stamens, and the franks with flower names, and having the piloting be inherently sexual was all good for invoking the importance of fertility to our themes, but it's also pretty surface level symbolism. It's not hard to leap from stamen pistol descriptors to, hey, sexual reproduction might be important to the story's ideas. But a giant bomb meant to put an end to an ancient threat that is also metaphorically a bouquet representing fertility as well? That's pretty inspired. It keeps us from dividing creation and destruction apart from each other. And it's also appropriate for Hero and Zero Two's wedding, as it itself is forged in violence and physical transformation. So remember this dual nature of our mothership bomb bouquet thing. I will reference it again when we get to speculation. So Fate vs. Desire, um, as mentioned, this one is all over this episode. Uh, the Nines face it, Hachi and Nana face it, um, but it is especially strong in the stories of our two couples. This episode begins with both of the girls beholden to a certain fate, a fate that involves physical changes for themselves. Zero Two is inside Strelizia, and Kokoro is pregnant. Neither in their current state chose the situation exactly, but both got here because of choices in their past. And neither appears to be trying to deviate from their path. However, the guy in each of those pairs still has the option to choose. Even though both have also made promises or taken actions that led them here, Mitsuru and Hiro are each still able to turn aside from the destiny presented to them. A rare chance, and one not really given to the girls. And yet, both girls try to resist the attempts to join their paths together. Neither will accept that the guy surrender to this fate out of some form of responsibility or a promise made under different circumstance. It's selfless and decent of them. There is no thought from either Kokoro or Zero Two to coerce the guys to join them just because they themselves are past the point of choosing. Thus, the battle for each guy is deciding what they want and then convincing the girl that they want to join together regardless of what that may mean. The fight is won when each convinces their girl that being together is an expression of their own desire, not just an extension of their sense of fate. For Mitsuru and Kokoro, the fact of never recovering their memories made this choice uh, even more poignant. The idea that they should be together because of a time they don't remember must feel very much like the hand of fate. It's believable to resist it and question it. Kokoro's skepticism of Mitsuru is understandable, and he did himself no favors by referring to his responsibility at the episode's beginning. Yet, if they are the same people underneath, it's not exactly a stretch to believe that they would begin to feel something again. I do wish we'd had more time to develop them again post-memory wipe. Um, I feel we got a lot more screen time of them acting differently than of them growing together again. Uh, it's a nitpick, sure. Uh, but their initial romance was pretty believable, and was developed slowly but steadily. We saw it coming 10 episodes before their actual marriage. In that respect, the groundwork for them to be a couple had been laid, but I will confess that it makes their specific instance of desire versus fate a little bit weaker. Hero and Zero Two's part of this theme, though, more than makes up for it. Um, I spent a lot of time on the culmination of Zero Two's character arc in the walkthrough already, so we won't retread that ground. I just want to re-emphasize how powerful the idea of fate really was to their story. The picture book laid out their path, and yet even knowing what it was still didn't make it avoidable. I think it's entirely possible that Zero Two and Hero had different ideas of what that fate meant to them, at least until right at the end. Hero makes a comment about the picture book story being sad two different times, once in their youth, and again when she is recreating it. Young her knew how the story ended, with the princess having to leave the prince behind, yet she chose to bend her entire will toward becoming human anyway. The ending didn't frighten her away. She expands on this even further when she begins to recreate it in episode 16. Despite Hiro reiterating that the story is sad, 
She instead says that it was her first pretty thing, that she met Hiro and wanted to have something beautiful with him. She wasn't looking at the end and saying, how sad. She was looking at the whole story and saying, how beautiful. Between a lovely but tragic story or having no story at all, Zero Two chooses the former. She constructed her whole life around becoming that princess while expecting that it would end in sadness. She wanted it anyway. Maybe she even assumed she could have no other fate, that a fleeting life with her prince was the best she could aspire to. She wasn't going to ask for more. That is, until she got to really experience being human. The part immediately after this recreation scene we just referenced is her discussion of finding out what humanity really is. Only now can she understand the bitterness of that final page. Yet this is the fate she chose when she pursued being human and being with Hero. This is why I think she developed resistance to the idea of Hero joining her. Not just because of resisting Hero giving up his humanity, I mean that is probably the bigger part of it, but because she fears she caught him up in her own fate. The very next episode, they will again be discussing the picture book when the subject of Hero's horns comes up. Zero Two will theorize that it was because they rode together, or because he ingested her blood. And then she will say, regretfully, I've drastically altered your destiny, haven't I? It's one thing for her to choose this fate, knowing its heartbreaking end. To her, even if it ends sadly, it could still be beautiful, still be worthwhile. We might want to remember the sentiment of hers, too, depending on how our next episode goes. Um, yet it is another thing to have caught Hero in the story's wake. Once she sees her choices as either flee or change the prince forever, the expected fate of the picture book unfolds clearly before her, and the choice is not so strange, however sad. Zero Two then, for most of the story, was accepting of this idea of fate. And after all, her own existence was only due to some future task, some destiny that she was reminded of probably her whole life. Fate is a normalized concept for her. Yet Hero resisted, just as he resisted his situation in Garden, just as he resisted the picture book's inevitable conclusion. As he said to Dr. Franks after the squad rejected Papa, we'll decide our fate ourselves. Zero Two assumes the story will still play out the same. Yet because of beginning to understand what all that means, what humanity is, what love is, she loses her peace with this ending. She doesn't want it to go this way. She was happy to choose a bitter end just to have a story she belonged to at all, but now she wants a different fate. She wants another end. She is hoping that Dr. Franks was right, that although fate is cruel more often than not, it can be quite powerless in the face of desire. When Hero refuses to turn aside, refuses to live out the story of the prince, then she can finally release this acceptance of her fate. She can accept her desire instead. See, Hero never cared about her being human. He was never put off by her true nature. She always struggled to believe this. Yet when he is willing to surrender his own humanity to be with her, then she can believe. And doing so doesn't just transform her, and it doesn't just transform Hero. It transforms that last picture book page. So that brings us to our last speculation. What do we think a finale will look like for this series? There are a lot of thematic patterns that will be looking for their final argument. There is an entire alien civilization to be confronted, and an entire other civilization that needs to start rebuilding, perhaps even two. Yet somewhere in all that, what we really care about is the fate of a dozen characters we've come to worry over and root for. I assume we can think of our finale as two halves. These might not be literal halves, but two primary situations we expect to be resolved. The first of these to talk about is actually the resolution I expect to happen second. Um, that is, the last thing that happens in the series, and that is the resolution of what happens on Earth. I have supposed for some time that our finale will involve a time skip of some variety, a denouement or epilogue in which we get a peek into the future for our characters and for humanity. Um, I especially believe this because I think the birth of Kokoro's child, uh, or children, is something too important to leave as a hypothetical future. After the way Ichigo sent Hiro and Zero Two off at the end, I am even more inclined to believe that we will visit Earth again, but in a future state. How far off, I don't really know. Um, the following spring is about to the earliest, I think is likely. Much like Kokoro's childbirth, the imagery of Earth in springtime is probably too thematically significant to pass up. 
How far into the future will largely depend on how the other half goes, Hero and Zero Two's resolution. I fully expect Ichigo and the squad to make good on their goal of making a home for them all. So we will see things like the crops extending outward for Mistletine to encompass more and more of the land. We will see the frozen children woken up and added to the population. We'll see some progress in other relationships. Maybe this means a pair the spares situation, where Ichigo and Goro do become an item, or Nada and Hachi, or even Ikuno or Fatoshi with Naomi or something. Depending on how far into the future we go, I wouldn't be surprised to find a pregnant Miku. I expect Kokoro's child is going to unleash the greatest outbreak of baby fever in humanity's history. Speaking of Kokoro's child, is it going to matter at all that Mitsuru once rode with Zero Two? I mean, I'm pretty sure this is about humanity rejoining the natural order, so I don't think the child being a Klaxo Sapien is most likely or anything, but we never have revisited the significance of his physical state after piloting with Zero Two. Now, there may be some other rekindling of Klaxo society, though I do not know how, uh, but I'm not sure what all those ships in orbit around Mars are going to do otherwise. That said, what part of the future we see all depends on what happens with Sterlesia beyond the warp gate. So what will that showdown look like? To answer that, I want us to think about the way this show has been different from a lot of the shows people are tempted to compare it to. I understand the comparisons with Kill la Kill and Gurren Lagann, uh, what with Trigger's name on it, and especially the late addition of extending the story beyond Earth. There is also the inevitable comparison to Evangelion, especially once genetic alteration and an assimilation plot entered into the story. But I think there is a fundamental difference between the way battles are treated in all of those examples and the way they are treated in Darling in the Franks. Let's use Evangelion for our comparison, as it is the most famous and influential. Think about how the rising and falling tension is handled in that series. The story is structured around the conflicts with the invading angels. Almost every episode revolves around a new angel threat and the lengths our characters must go to in order to overcome. This keeps the pace relatively frenetic, the arcs very short, and the characterization is simply something that happens along the way. You learn about who everyone is and increasingly understand the strange nature of the various organizations as a result of these escalating confrontations. The actual fighting in the series comprises most of the episode to episode tension, with character tensions being a slower development. Gurren Lagann and Kill la Kill and a lot of other mech shows follow a similar pattern. The next arm confrontation is the crucible around which character and theme are defined. By comparison, Darling the Franks has never been about the battle. If someone told you this show was about boy-girl pairs piloting robots to fight off monsters that come up through the ground, well, okay, that is the premise, but it's actually about the interpersonal relationships, about the cycle of death and rebirth and fertility, and about sexuality and romance and love as a force in opposition to those who would attempt to constrain nature and humanity. The fighting is background, and very rarely does any of the story actually turn around it. The battles are always just the setting for personal revelations or character moments instead. There is no sense of progress towards some goal that is achieved by succeeding. Until the actual Grand Crevasse fight, every battle is simply housekeeping. If they could have simply avoided fighting altogether, the result would have been the same. It's only the changes to character relationships during these battles that actually matters. Let's walk through them so I know that I'm being clear. Um, the very first Klaxosaur conflict comes in the first episode, and is arguably the most like the battles that one expects from a mech show. In retrospect though, it was only there to introduce the Franks and Klaxosaurs, and Zero Two stampede mode and superlativeness, and the fact that she kills her partners. The second fight is just a stage for testing the trust between partners, with Miku and Zorome, as well as showing the sinister side of that with Mitsuru and Zero Two. The third fight exists to give desperation to Hero and Zero Two so they will override the rules keeping them apart, as well as showing that they can operate with the team while still existing apart from them. The fourth fight is meant to show us how individualistic our squad is compared to all others, as well as set up Hero's death and rebirth into someone with a new sense of purpose. After this target beta fight, the purpose of the battles as purely stages for characterization becomes even more apparent. 
The fifth fight only exists to set up the boys versus girls conflict. The sixth is only there to characterize Godro and his relationship with Ichigo. The seventh is similar, except it is for characterizing Mitsuru by bringing his personal crisis to a boiling point. That fight also gives us a taste of Zero Two's increasing desperation, something that the last fights before the Grand Crevasse are especially meant to illustrate. I mean, the significance of Klaxosaurus showing up near Garden for the first time has never even been mentioned again. That obviously didn't really matter. Even the Grand Crevasse, which is the first fight past episode one whose outcome actually changed the narrative, was still mostly about demonstrating to us what kind of people Ape really are and bringing the conflict between Hiro, Ichigo, and Zero Two to a head. Now the taking of Star Entity and the Princess and the reveal of Verm and all that is the exception to all this. That was both progress from the previous battle and a giant shift in the narrative direction of the series. Those two episodes were much more like what typically comprise a mecha show, especially the examples that we've talked about. Yet it is the exception here. Even this episode with a giant showdown in space is just setting. This is no more perfectly illustrated than by its conclusion. Once the real battle of Hero getting through to Zero Two is successful, the space battle is completely wrapped up like 30 seconds later. So what am I saying? Well, in shows like Evangelion, the tension revolves around each new challenge and the lengths required to win the day. In Darling, though, the conflict in all of these encounters is less about the actual Klaxosaur battle, or whatever battle, and entirely about the human drama playing over it. The tension is not how will they win, but how will they change. Keeping all that in mind, what should we expect from true Strelizia wading into Verm's homeland with a giant bomb in tow? Especially considering all we talked about with that bomb, that it may be creation and destruction together, a symbol of transformation against the stasis of Verm. Doesn't it seem unlikely that we are walking into some enormous fight scene? Doesn't it also seem unlikely that they will simply detonate the bomb and blow all of Verm away, possibly taking themselves with it? Sacrificing themselves for everyone else is not beyond reason, um, that's not what I mean, but simply extinguishing all of Verm with violence doesn't seem quite right to me anymore, at least without knowing more about Verm. Now, I confess I do not have a good idea what the final episode will look like. A theoretical epilogue could take up the last 90 seconds or the last half of the show, but I do think there's a good chance we will get to peer behind the mask of Verm some explanation of how they themselves began down this path. It may be then that the bomb is not so much about destroying them as destroying their ideology, reintroducing creation and destruction to their civilization. I don't know how I'm expecting that to work exactly, but thematically that is a stronger triumph of transformation over stasis than merely eliminating their half of the conflict entirely. Whether that means forcing apart their hive mind, or making them mortal again, or fertile again, or forced to take forms rather than being formless, I don't really know. I, I hope to be surprised. I think Kringhorn is going to figure into the showdown in a way that Verm doesn't expect. Um, being made of Klaxosaurs and its designation as the Lance of Life implies to me that it is probably more chaotic than Verm is equipped to understand or control. If the Balder myth is going to show up finally, they would need to serve as the ship in which the unkillable are buried, brought low by a weapon made of mistletoe. That does suggest that Hero and Zero Two destroy Verm in at least some respect. They have been the ones most strongly associated with mistletoe in the series, after all. But it may be the destruction that implies death and rebirth, rather than simple annihilation. I'm excited to see. So that is it then. Let us sit back and see what our storytellers are made of.